Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for Teledyne ISCO's chromatography webinar focused on general chromatographic techniques for natural products purification. Today's webinar is being led by Jack Silver, one of Teledyne ISCO's applications chemists. If you have any questions or comments during the webinar, please utilize the chat function within Zoom and all questions will be answered at the end. And at this time, I will turn it over to Jack. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, we're going to talk about general chromatographic techniques for natural products purification. And uh, what we will uh, talk about are the initial steps that you do before you even do an extraction. Uh, we're going to do a very quick overview of chromatography. We will talk about solvent extraction and then follow-up chromatography. And we will discuss how your solvent extraction can suggest which chromatography to use. We'll talk about column screening options and also how you can select a solvent from column screening. We'll talk about self-packed columns on automatic flash chromatography and special columns. Uh, column and solvent screening with wide polarity range chromatography and how you can use a scouting gradient to get an efficient preparative HPLC gradient and you, how we can do that from just a bioassay where you don't necessarily see a peak but you know that one fraction in your scouting gradient was active. So uh, the first thing we need to remember is natural products are different. In synthetic chemistry, you already know uh, what you have over here. You've synthesized this compound, so you already know what that compound is. In natural product, you are starting with just a leaf over here, or perhaps a fungus or bacterial extract, or some other product, but we know that there's some activity in there, but we don't know what it is. Uh, we have unknown product, products and therefore unknown chromatography. So what I'm going to do is help suggest ways to make it easier to purify the compound and identify it more quickly. So the initial steps prior to extraction is very simply a literature database uh, search. Uh, do a search on family, genus, and species, and you can generate a list of known compounds and existing purification methods. This will enable uh, faster screening of known compounds. Uh, places to look are Journal of Natural Products and the ACS Journal Search. Uh, the reason why I suggest a general journal search instead of just looking in a Journal of Natural Products Sometimes interesting compounds might be in, say, the Journal of Medicinal Chemistry. Uh, suppose someone has a compound that is a very unique class or a very unique mechanism of activity. They might publish it in, say, Journal of Medicinal Chemistry or maybe even the Journal of the American Chemical Society or uh, some other journal. Uh, you can avoid reinventing the wheel by doing a journal search. And I've also listed ScienceDirect, uh, which is another uh, group of journals. And then there's a couple of uh, databases over here. I will leave the screen up for just a second so you guys can take cell phone pictures. Uh, also, please be aware that this presentation will be posted so you can get the references later. So you can play back the video and then get the references. So I'll leave this open for about another five seconds so you can get a cell phone picture. And then I will move on to the next slide where I talk about assay literature search. Assay literature search provides information about compound classes found in an assay. Uh, for example, alkaloids are very common in central nervous system screens. However, not everything that will show up will be an alkaloid, but alkaloids do have a propensity for showing up in uh, those sorts of screens. Uh, phenolics are also common in antioxidant uh, biological screenings. However, not everything that's 
shows up as an uh, antioxidant will necessarily be phenolic. So it's just a general guidelines. Uh, again, it's a just purification strategies, and uh, where you get this information are from journals. So if you're working on a muscarinic assay, go and look up in your journal search muscarinic and see what has been found uh, uh, previously and what classes of compounds tend to show activity. I mentioned internal databases, and I know that companies and labs maintain hit lists for different assays in their databases. So uh, when I worked over at Merck, uh, we had a listing of all the different compounds that showed uh, activity in the various biological assays. And even if not all of them were natural products, I could at least see what compound classes tend to be uh, in those assays. Uh, I'm going to do a very quick review of chromatography. Uh, for those who know chromatography very well, please bear with me. It's going to be very short, but it provides a foundation for what we will discuss later. So what is chromatography? Uh, separation of compounds in a mixture using a liquid mobile phase and a solid uh, support. Examples include uh, thin lead chromatography, flash chromatography, high-performance liquid chromatography, which is divided into analytical and preparative, UHPLC or UPLC, which uses smaller particles and higher pressure. We will not discuss UHPLC because that's purely analytical. And we will not discuss the finer details of chromatography, such as solvent modifiers. We will also very briefly cover solvent selectivity. Uh, but uh, in general, I want to understand, want everyone to understand a basis of chromatography. So uh, chromatography, the retentions, the compounds partition between uh, the stationary phase and the uh, mobile phase. Uh, equilibrium to the right is less retention. Equilibrium to the left, in other words, bound onto the stationary phase, means it's a later elution. And you can see that in these colored bands over here. Okay? Uh, so over here, the yellow band comes out earlier. It has less retention, whereas the blue band has a later elution, so it comes out later. A stronger solvent shifts the equilibrium more to the right so that the compound spends more time in the mobile phase and then it comes out a bit late, uh, uh, earlier. So we want to run a gradient from weak solvent to strong solvents. Okay, what is a weak solvent or a strong solvent? Bear with me for a couple of minutes. Uh, Thin lead chromatography is a very quick method to determine a reaction status, a very quick method to determine impurities. It is good for method development for flash chromatography, and if you are working with antifungals and antibacterial where you can grow your organisms on an agar plate, uh, thin lead chromatography is a very efficient and effective way to develop a uh, solvent method because you can lay your TLC plate down and you can see from where there's no growth, if your compound, if your active compound has moved, how much it has moved, and therefore you can develop a solvent method very, very easily on TLC plate. Uh, if you're running a biological assay, you know, uh, if you're looking for something that's an agonist or an antagonist and trying to uh, do something with a protein-protein interaction, TLC plate doesn't help you so much, and that's the disadvantage of them. We might try to maximize the distance between the spots and choose a solvent for that on TLC, but we really don't know if the compound is actually eluding or which of those spots is the active compound until we purify it. TLC is usually silica gel, but alumina and C18 and other bonded phases are used too. The bonded phases tend to be very slow with TLC plates, and uh, so it's uh, not so uh, useful for those. 
Uh, types of columns that we use include uh, normal phase, which is the original type of chromatography that Sweat used. The stationary phase is much more polar than the mobile phase, and you can see over here, examples include uh, silica, alumina, and even dial over here, uh, which can be run as normal phase. And the solvents include petroleum ether, hexane, cyclohexane, ethyl acetate, and going all the way up, and you can even run water on normal phase, and that's called aqueous normal phase or hillock. Okay? Other types of column are reverse phase. It is a newer column. Uh, even though it's been around forever, it is still newer than normal phase uh, because, and it's one of the first of the bonded phases. In this case, the mobile phase is more polar than the stationary phase. It's reverse from normal phase, hence the name reverse phase. Solvents include water, methanol, acetyl nitrile, and tetrahydrofuran. And you can see on the scale over here that C18 is very uh, nonpolar. Now, I mentioned solvents, weak solvents, and strong solvents earlier. So, uh, for normal phase, your very weak solvents are, are your. Uh, uh, solvents such as petroleum ether, hexane, your yeah, alkane, such as cyclohexane and heptane. A stronger solvent is toluene, and then you go into the ethers. Ethyl acetate, acetone, and dichloromethane are actually fairly similar in polarity, and therefore similar in solvent strength, and then water is a very, very strong solvent. For reverse phase, the weak solvent is actually water, and you can see that that's actually reversed from normal phase, which water is the strong solvent. And then your stronger solvents are methanol, acetyl nitrile, tetrahydrofuran, ethyl acetate, and dichloromethane. And these are used for non aqueous reverse phase, and we'll discuss that briefly a little bit later. Now, I mentioned that these solvents, uh, ethyl acetate, acetone, and dichloromethane, I mentioned that they are all similar in polarity. However, they do have some differences. Uh, these solvents are different than what we term selectivity over here. So uh, you see that we have different uh, groups of solvents that are grouped together. You see that the alcohols are all grouped together. So the only difference between them is solvent strength. And if you substitute, say, ethanol with 2-propanol, you might change the solvent strength, but the compounds are going to elute in a very similar order. You're not necessarily going to improve the purity of your compound. Uh, you will see that uh, acetone and, uh, and ethyl acetate are all together in group 6 over here. So uh, you have the same thing. But dichloromethane is uh, going to be in a different group than uh, group 6 over here. It's not showing up over here. And it's over in group 5. So substituting dichloromethane from either acetone or ethyl acetate might improve your purification. Okay, uh, the basics of chromatography are done. I'm going to talk about solvent partitioning, and in particular, something called cup chain partitioning. It is an initial purification technique for screening compounds. It is a liquid-liquid extraction, and you separate compounds by polarity and solubility. There are many, many variations, and cup chain himself had many variations to partition and extract. He started using these partitions back in the early 60s, and by the 70s, uh, he had a different set of uh, solvents that he liked to use for screening as his technique evolved. Uh, this particular variation does not use chlorinated solvent, so it's a little safer for people to use, and uh, it's also uh, perhaps a little more friendly, ecologically speaking. So this uh, partition starts off with uh, one gram of uh, extract, and then you mix it up with methanol water, 9-1 uh, solution, and uh, you might have some solids in there. You dissolve 40 mils of methanol at 10 mils of water. 
don't worry about suspended solids because those will hopefully get into one of the other solvents a little bit later. So then you partition in a separate toy funnel, uh, petroleum ether or hexane, two times 50 mils. And what you're going to wind up with is very, very nonpolar compounds are going to wind up in the organic phase. These will run on very, these are very nonpolar compounds. You use silica or alumina, non aqueous reverse phase, uh, no, C18, and you would use, say, hexane, toluene for these, or maybe hexane ethyl acetate. But again, because they get into an alkane, they have to be very nonpolar. Okay, so now what happens to the rest of the uh, material? You then take your methanol water layer and you add 25 mils of water to that, and you're going to get a methanol water 6 4 solution. You then partition this with ethyl acetate 2 times 30 mils, and you're going to have a phase with ethyl acetate. This is going to be medium polarity over here. You're going to have a mixture of fairly nonpolar compounds, and you're going to have a mixture of fairly polar compounds because some of this methanol over here is going to get into the ethyl acetate. So you're going to have a wide range of compound polarities over here. You're going to need to do a column solvent screen on this, uh, on anything that shows up in the ethyl acetate if you get activity over here. The aqueous phase is going to have uh, very polar compounds, and you're going to go into THF, 2 times 30 mils. And this THF over here is probably going to run with silica, and you're going to need very polar solvents such as dichloromethane, methanol, uh, that sort of thing, maybe aluminum oxide. Uh, your aqueous layer, if your activity is over there, uh, you're going to run very, very polar compounds and helix using silica or alumina would be useful here. Over here, your THF, I mentioned uh, very polar solvents. Uh, you also might consider C18, and you might need an AQ type of C18, such as C18AQ. Another type of solvent partitioning is fairly specific for alkaloids. Uh, it is a very fast method to screen, and it very often yields HPLC-ready sample. In other words, it's ready for prep LC. And uh, there's been a few times that I've used this solvent partitioning, and I was assigned the project on Monday, and by Friday I had the compound identified, and we knew what compound it was, and uh, we could then go on with the rest of the biology that we wanted. And this included the time it took for submission for biological assay and to get back to me. But how it works is you partition the extract between dichloromethane and 0.1 molar aqueous HCl. So how this works is now your uh, alkaloid then uh, Re, uh, combines with the HCl and gets into the aqueous layer as a salt. You then add ammonium hydroxide to your aqueous layer to pH 10. That then forces your alkaloid as a nonpolar free base, which then can be partitioned into dichloromethane, which will be the bottom layer that you can collect with your alkaloid. And then uh, you want to test everything for biological activity because most alkaloids can be partitioned this way, but if you have an alkaloid that also has a very polar group on it, like say sulfonic uh, uh, acid group or something like that, you might just want to sit into the uh, aqueous layer. That's one reason why I suggest ammonium hydroxide is that you're going to form a salt down there, ammonium chloride, which you can, it is a volatile salt and you can remove that with a freeze dryer. Now we get into the chromatography that we were uh, talking about earlier uh, with the cup chain partitioning, and we start to put everything together. So wide polarity range chromatography, you use a range of miscible solvents to elute compounds off a column. You start with a weak solvent and use a succession of stronger solvents to elute the compounds. And what this does is it provides an approximation of the compound polarity 
Uh, it provides the best opportunity to elude the unknown compounds. Either. Remember, we don't know what our compound is, so we don't know how the compound will elude. Uh, it also means that we stand a chance of washing the compound off the column. So even with silica gel, there's a very good chance we'll get everything off the column. Uh, it provides, uh, it suggests other solvents that we might use based on the polarity range which eludes the compound. Uh, remember the strong solvent causes the compound to elude down the column, so here's an example. Uh, we go from a weak to strong solvent. So over here, this is using a uh, diol column. Uh, we're running it as normal phase. So we start off with hexane, and we go to isopropanol in this case. Okay, so we start off and we go from hexane to isopropanol. And then we go isopropanol to water. Okay, so why isopropanol? It's miscible with hexane. It's also miscible with water. So we run this first gradient and we get a collection of compounds that come off over here. But we also, in the second gradient, we get these compounds here that do not dilute until we add some water. So uh, we can collect everything. Uh, our column uh, comes off uh, relatively clean. And uh, we can then uh, see what, how to uh, run the next step. So columns used for initial screening is I like to use silica, alumina, and diol. So I like to use all three columns for normal phase. For reverse phase, I like to use C18. Uh, and then for iron exchange columns, those are self-packed columns. I like to run an SAX column and an SCX column. I'm going to use capsaicin to simulate an active compound. Uh, this is a real extract from green chili peppers, and I use the variety of detection techniques, UV, all wavelengths collection, which is uh, something we use uh, to look at all of the different wavelengths uh, in a uh, system, uh, so it reduces the chance that we will miss an active compound. Uh, I use evaporative light scattering detection and also mass-directed fractionation. I used about 750 milligrams on a 12-gram column, and initially you think that that's an awful lot of, of uh, material for such a small column, until you realize that our compound is probably present in a small quantity. Our compound might be 1 or 2 percent of that 750 milligrams. And except where I noticed, uh, where I make a notation, I use solid load cartridges because I can absorb the material onto those cartridges, and then uh, the compound eludes at the correct place in the chromatography. So normal phase wide polarity range chromatography. Now I, here I used a different gradient than for the dial. I prefer to use the same gradient for all of my column screening, but I'm showing different choices of solvent that you might use. So over here I use hexane, uh, at the beginning to ethyl acetate. And then, uh, because of the system I was using, I went uh, from ethyl acetate to 100% methanol, but I ran the gradient in reverse over here. Then I ran uh, 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 methanol up to about 50% water, uh, because most things tend to elude at about 50% uh, water off a silica gel over here. I use detection of 254 and all of my different detectors. And the one thing to note is that this, even though we have a very complex mixture, we're getting some very clean mass specs uh, uh, off of the column. Uh, however, uh, even though I get some very nice clean mass spectra, I don't see capsaicin. Uh, it either came off very, very broad in a very broad peak, or it did not come off at all. The next thing I ran was wide polarity range uh, uh, with, uh, with the diol column using the uh, hexane 2 propanol water gradient that I used before. Again, I'm just showing you different types of gradients that could work. Uh, diol is often less retentive than silica, so something that might stick on the silica might come off of a diol column. 
Also, if you're working with a very, very non-polar compound, you actually might get better retention on dial as compared to silica because a very, very non-polar compound might not want to adsorb very strongly onto very polar silica, but dial is somewhat less polar, and so therefore compounds might retain a little bit better there. We're still seeing clean mass spectra, but alas, my active compound isn't showing up. I run alumina normal phase, and I use my gradient to hexane to ethyl acetate to methanol to water. Uh, it has a different selectivity compared to diol or silica. Likewise, diol has a different selectivity. Uh, what I find is that uh, the catechins eluded cleanly. So here they are. Uh, I can see the mass spec for them, but they're all mixed up together. Uh, I can still see other compounds eluding later, but uh, it still uh, it gave me a nice clean batch of capsaicin, so as a class they eluded very nicely. So let's look at uh, ready set bar of gold uh, reverse phase uh, wine polarity range. I ran my gradient water to methanol, uh, nothing surprising there, and then I ran methanol to dichloromethane, okay? The dichloromethane washes off very nonpolar compounds, and this helps to clean your column as well. And you can still see that we have a lot of compounds that are still coming off in this methanol to dichloromethane. And this portion of the gradient here is an example of non aqueous reverse phase. What we find here is that the capsaicin compounds are well resolved from one another, but we have a lot of impurities uh, that also co-eluded, okay? However, even though we have impurities that co-eluded, this is still useful information because uh, we get the cleanest purification of capsaicin as a class from alumina, but the C18 resolves the individual compounds. The other thing that we learned is that the capsaicin is detected, uh, at least in my hands, as an M plus sodium peak. So uh, when you uh, run your compounds and you look at your mass spectra and you're trying to compare against possible known compounds, remember to evaluate adducts such as solvent adducts. So under ESI conditions, you'll very often will see your M plus H plus methanol or M plus H plus acetyl nitrile or various other solvent adducts. You might also see a charge carrier or an adduct other than M plus H. So you might see M plus sodium or M plus potassium. So keep that in mind. Also, evaluate fragments. For instance, uh, if you have an alcohol, you might have loss of water from your uh, compound, especially if you have some conjugation that can uh, form. You might have uh, M plus H minus water. So keep that in mind. Uh, the column screening allowed me to correlate the activity and the compound mass spectra and help to identify the compound earlier than you otherwise might. So putting it all together, the capsaicin peak from uh, Lumina is run on C18 as an additional uh, purification method. You might recall that the C18 showed the compound eluded uh, very late in the gradient. So it did not elude very early from C18, so I can flatten out the gradient. Uh, to improve the resolution and shorten the runtime and elute the peaks a bit faster. So instead of starting off at 5 or 10 percent uh, methanol, I can start off at a higher percent methanol. Uh, the active compound is known to elute in methanol water, so I did not bother with the non aqueous reverse phase portion of the gradient. So again, I know where the compound eludes. I could optimize the purification based on that. And so here we go, uh, flash purification on ready set gold C18, I went from 50 to 100 instead of 5 to 100 uh, percent methanol. Um, because I ran the C18 column, it suggested this purification step would work. And you can see that we uh, flatten out the gradient and I can resolve the compounds and it came off very, very cleanly. Uh, the mixture was actually clean enough from the alumina that you could actually pop it onto PrEP HPLC. 
And so what we see over here is this isn't the uh, sample from the previous slide, so keep that in mind, but it does contain the first diluting compounds. We can uh, purify the compound very uh, easily, and we will talk a little bit later about how to generate these gradients. And uh, for more detail on that, uh, we also have had other webinars. Uh, I'm going to talk real quick about specialty columns and how you can use those for solvent screening uh, very shortly. Uh, these tend to be uh, specialty columns. You have to pack them yourself because they sometimes need to be pre-swollen to use with your solvent, and therefore they're difficult to pre-pack. CHP20 uh, polymeric reverse phase is commonly used for natural products, and it tends to swell slightly different uh, whether you're using uh, water or methanol, so you can't pack that ahead of time usually. Uh, you also can't use that for non-aqueous reverse phase because it is a polymeric reverse phase, so you just use that with water and uh, methanol. Cephadex LH20 <clears throat> tends to be a normal phase or a size exclusion column. It does well depending on which solvent you use. Uh, polyamide is, tends to be run as reverse phase and it's very good for phenolic compounds and antioxidants. Iron exchange, uh, strong cation, strong anion exchange is good for phenolics, alkaloids, and acids. And why would you want to run them on a flash system? Uh, you no, know, it's very good. You have pumps with solvent management, so you have a controlled flow, so you can control your chromatography and get the same results each time if you need to run <clears throat> another column. You have a detector so you can see what's going on. You also have a fraction collector that's built into the system, so uh, why not take advantage of that? So over here, Cephadex uh, LH20 uh, running on one of our uh, older uh, flash systems. And uh, you see that the compound is at the top of the column over here. And uh, uh, it's going to run down the column. And all I did is I just took the tubing from the top of the column and I connected it to the uh, flash system uh, using a lure lock fitting. And then at the bottom, I connected it so it can go onto the detector and fraction collector. And uh, it ran very well, and I could purify uh, the compound. And I took this fraction over here, and then I ran it on a C18AQ column, and I could, de uh, and I could collect uh, uh, catechins uh, very easily. And uh, these peaks are pure by HPLC, and I was able to identify them easily. Uh, another column that's very useful for phenolic compounds in general are polyamide. It's a reverse phase technique. It's a good intermediate purification that you can use uh, after, say, running an iron exchange column. It's very, very useful to remove tannins, and tannins tend to cause nonspecific binding and false positive in assays. Uh, well, tannins get their name because they used to uh, tan leather, and leather is nothing more than a whole bunch of proteins and peptides, and it's very good for that, but very bad for our assays. Uh, and over here, what I ran was a uh, gradient from uh, uh, starting off with uh, water going to 100% methanol. <clears throat> then I ran methanol to acetone. And then uh, for this last step, I ran uh, acetone up to 100% uh, water containing 5% ammonia. And the 5% ammonia helps to knock off some compounds, as you can see, and I get a collection of peaks. So I got one, two, three, four peaks that uh, came off the column. I then uh, ran those on our, uh, on our preparative HPLC. And this first peak, uh, <clears throat> uh, you can see, is still a fairly complex mixture. <coughs> In fact, they all are fairly complex. <coughs> Excuse me. But at least I can uh, simplify them somewhat. Uh, the next thing uh, was a uh, self-packed ion exchange column. Uh, 
This is called anion exchange, and this is very useful for uh, phenolics. I condition the column with the uh, weak counter ion. Uh, in this case, uh, I was uh, using uh, either formic acid or acetic acid. In this case, it was acetic acid, and it displaces the chloride ion, which is usually uh, which is, media is usually uh, conditioned with from the factory. Uh, the compounds that uh, we are trying to extract usually will not displace a chloride ion. We uh, then ionize the compound and we dissolve the sample in methanol with a little bit of ammonia. Uh, we then have an initial wash in uh, uh, methanol, and that's what we're seeing here, so we're washing off any uh, uh, ammonia. We're also washing off any compounds that might be nonpolar or cationic. Uh, what we're looking at here are phenolic compounds from green tea. And this was actually, uh, this extract was actually used for some of the experiments earlier uh, with the cephadex and also with the, uh, well, with the polyamide resin. And it's a good part of our column screening. Uh, I just run the single gradient over here uh, with 5% uh, acetic acid and water. And then I have a wash uh, with just uh, water at the end and some compounds come off over there as well. Using strong cation exchange, you then have you also have to condition the column first with a weak counter ion. Uh, in this case, uh, I washed the column with one normal sulfuric acid uh, so that the column was in the proton form. I then washed the column with the methanol. And I then loaded on uh, my compound, uh, half a gram of extract for 15 grams of uh, SCX resin. And I ran a gradient uh, uh, with the uh, first uh, gradient was uh, with uh, water. And then I used up to 5% uh, acetic acid. And, uh, and uh, then I used ammonium hydroxide. And I could collect uh, alkaloids that are eluded in different in uh, different uh, 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 peaks. The advantage of this over the uh, extraction that I described earlier is that I can resolve the different alkaloids. The uh, extraction earlier, the alkaloid extraction, gets all of the alkaloids together. Another possible advantage is that uh, alkaloids that might have gone into the aqueous solution because they have a polar group attached to them might be uh, collected and resolved here. Uh, <clears throat> next thing I'm going to talk about is HPLC uh, method development from assays. Uh, you collect your fractions from a scouting run, so uh, and then screen for biological activity. So we have a feature on our AccuPrep system where we can run a scouting run, and then we can calculate a focused gradient based on that scouting run. So we use a 20 by 150 millimeter column. Uh, this is a scouting run, and uh, it's a very fast run. Uh, the gradient only runs for six minutes. I collected 10 mil fractions. Uh, for this column, five mil fractions will work very well. So uh, this was 30 seconds per fraction. If we collected five mils, it would be 15 seconds per fraction. And I found activity in tubes uh, number 16 and 17 over here. Uh, I targeted the peak in tube number 17 over here for my focused gradient. So how this works is I then, uh, to calculate a focused gradient, I selected the area with the biological activity. Over here, you can see this uh, red line over here. I then choose the column that I will be using uh, to purify my, uh, my mixture. And I press the focus button, and it then calculates for me a focus gradient that you see over here. And the advantage of doing this is if my compound hypothetically came out, say, over here where we do not see a peak, I could still touch that area and still generate a focus gradient since there's many reasons why we might not see the peak. It might be that we were looking at the wrong wavelength or 
maybe the compound has a weak UV activity or any number of reasons, we still have a chance of calculating an efficient focus gradient. So uh, this was calculated from that run earlier. We get baseline resolution, and the arrows show the active compounds, and you see that there's one that's very, very small. Uh, I still collected everything just in case I had a very, very tiny peak that still might have been active. So the targeted peak eluded at six minutes. It's a very short run with same solvent, and it's a shallow focus gradient that maximizes resolution, and it's very easy to uh, run off of the uh, system. So in conclusion, before purification, do a literature search first. A column screening allows determination of your best initial purification uh, conditions, and uh, it allows you uh, to uh, determine the best column to be used. It can be used to suggest your purification strategy. White polarity range allows for complete elution of unknown compounds and it complements uh, column screening uh, by suggesting the polarity of a compound. And we also talked about how you can use a scouting gradient to calculate a focus gradient to purify your compound in the final stages of uh, purification. At this point, uh, we can now uh, open uh, the discussion for questions. Great. Thank you, Jack. And just a reminder, this is being recorded and will be available through Teledyne ISCO's YouTube channel um, later on this week or early next week. The first question that we've had come in is, is it feasible to use organic solvents on an RP column? Okay, uh, the, uh, I'm assuming RP means reverse phase. And the answer is, uh, if you're using a silica-based reverse phase column, it absolutely is feasible uh, to uh, use uh, organic solvents. That's non-aqueous reverse phase. And uh, the person who asked that question, if you send us an email, uh, we could send you some application notes and posters that describe the uh, use of uh, of uh, such chromatography for very nonpolar solvents. <clears throat> if you're using a polymeric reverse phase, you really don't want to do that because uh, the column might swell, and uh, when it swells, it dismisses the uh, uh, the uh, when it swells up, it interrupts the flow, and uh, you can't pump solvent down the column and you've ruined the column. But if you're using silica-based column, it works very well. Uh, I've got another question. Uh, when I run a column and I see M plus NA from the mass uh, detector, where does the NA come from? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, the most likely place it came from is the glassware somewhere uh, in the situation. Uh, the, uh, we often will use glass bottles for our solvents, and glass has sodium and potassium, and so it could get into the carrier solvent that way. Another place it could have come from is it could have been uh, bound to the column as it was eluding down the column. Uh, if you're doing a uh, reduction with, say, sodium borohydride or something like that, uh, you could also get sodium uh, as well from there as well. So the sodium can probably comes from the glassware, although if you're doing a, uh, a chemical reaction, it could be a result of your uh, reduction. Uh, also, your solvents uh, may contain some sodium ions uh, also from the glassware as well, because uh, solvents often come in glass bottles. Uh, any other questions? We'll give it just one more minute to see if any last minute questions come in. And like Jack, like Jack said previously, if you do have questions after we wrap up today, uh, you can always email us or contact us through our website and we can uh, direct you in the right <coughs> to the right person at that time. And we've had one more question come in, Jack. In yeah. normal silica columns, which is the maximum percentage of water that I can use? 
That's a very good question. And uh, with normal silica columns, you can run up to 100% water. And uh, I'm going to get some people who uh, might wonder about that because there's a bit of a uh, myth that says that silica dissolves in methanol. And if it dissolves in methanol, it will surely dissolve in water. <clears throat> uh, if you keep the, your mobile phase either neutral or acidic, and preferably acidic, uh, you can run up to 100% methanol and 100% water. Uh, if you're using uh, silica-based columns under basic conditions, pH 7.5 and, and higher, you start to dissolve the silica under uh, polar solvents such as methanol and water, so you don't want to run basic solutions. Uh, in fact, uh, one of my colleagues over here uh, was running an ELSD and was running methanol water and the water, uh, I'm sorry, um, dichloromethane methanol, and the methanol contained ammonium hydroxide, and when they got up to about 10% methanol using DCM methanol with ammonium hydroxide, they started to see silica start to come off the column. So uh, under basic conditions, uh, you can lose silica, but under acidic or neutral conditions, it runs just fine. And in fact, uh, you can run bare silica with, say, acetonitrile water, and uh, that's called uh, hydrophilic interacting liquid uh, chromatography, or HILIC, and I alluded for uh, earlier. Another question says, when screening alumina columns, do I have a preference for acidic or basic alumina? Uh, either of those will work, although I actually tend to use neutral alumina unless I have some idea that the compound might be acidic or basic. Uh, another question is, is it possible to use ethyl acetate or dichloromethane on reverse phase column? And the answer is absolutely if you're running a silica-based column and not a polymeric reverse phase. Uh, for those columns, I'd like to start off with, say, methanol in place of water and then run my gradient up to ethyl acetate or dichloromethane. And uh, that will uh, cause compounds to elute. And again, uh, that's a very good method for cleaning a column if you think you have some uh, non-polar material stuck on the uh, column. So those are all very good uh, questions. And uh, We've had uh, one more question come in here, Jack. Um, how would you suggest removing chlorophyll from plant extract? Uh, okay. <clears throat> Well, chlorophyll is actually surprisingly nonpolar, so uh, running it on silica gel can remove it. Uh, usually, unless it's showing up as uh, your active compound, I find chlorophyll just to be a uh, uh, to be somewhat of an annoyance as much as anything, uh, because there's. Uh, because in the process of purifying all the other compounds I don't want, the chlorophyll goes off uh, with it. So, for example, if I'm working with phenolic compounds, uh, the iron exchange column won't capture the chlorophyll. It just goes away on its own. Uh, so it's a nuisance, but that's about all it is in general. Uh, there's a, a question <clears throat> about... Uh, uh, method for isolation of gum and resin from flash chromatography. Uh, gums and resins tend to be compounds that contain sugar in general. And so uh, I would tend to use uh, maybe a cup chain extraction and just uh, extract with water and hopefully those will go over there. And that's just a suggestion. Uh, it really depends on the sort of gum. Uh, sometimes uh, doing a trituration uh, into, say, uh, a, a hexane, you dissolve the sample in a very, very small amount of uh, methanol, or preferably ethanol, and triturate into hexane might uh, make your compound as an easy-to-handle powder rather than a gummy solution. Uh, how do I suggest removing phenolics or other browning reactive compounds from small peptides? 
Uh, one thing you might try is the polyamide resin that I uh, suggested earlier because the, uh, it tends to grab onto uh, phenolics uh, a little bit. Uh, that would be one thing I might try. Uh, another possibility is a uh, strong anion exchange resin. Hopefully your peptides go through. However, I recognize peptides also have the acid end as well. Finally, uh, you might try reverse phase chromatography because uh, your, pep your peptides are going to be infoteric to some degree. Your phenolics are going to tend to be acidic, so hopefully they come out a little bit uh, uh, differently than your peptides. So those are just some suggestions I would uh, try. Great. Okay, well, I think we will wrap up there. I don't see any other questions coming in at this time. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today, and thank you to Jack for presenting on this topic. Um, again, this is being recorded and will be available later on this week. And if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out through Zoom to me, and I will pass it along, or directly to Jack or any of our um, other colleagues at Teledyne ISCO. So at this time, thanks to everyone for joining us, and have a great rest of your day. Yep. Everyone, thank you for your time, and I appreciate the time that you took to talk to us.